I think we should uh, try to get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Will Wright. You know, Will can be uh, thought of as the kind of um, many, many ways. Earlier this today, he got um, uh, dis uh, described as the 21st century Dewey. Some of us consider him the game, game designer extraordinaire. Others think of him as having one of the world's greatest imaginations. We can take a vote at the end. So let me just introduce Will. Come on up. Hi, everybody. I uh, if we could dim the light so you can see the slides a little bit better. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, entertainment and kind of what I call the hive mind. When I was a kid, I read this book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and it had a huge impact on me. Not so much for the overt message in there, but the kind of underlying message that there's no one perspective that you can have on any one thing that's the truth. In fact, the more perspectives you can have, the better. And uh, I found that very useful later in life, you know, really just the idea that perspectives in some sense are more valuable than solutions. And so I'm probably going to be a little bit uh, heavier today in offering perspectives than specific conclusions and solutions. Uh, now, I make video games, which culturally, you know, are kind of an interesting place right now. A lot of people that don't play games, you know, see me as something like a drug pusher, addicting their kids to these things, and they feel threatened by them. But uh, I think there's kind of a broader view of games that's starting to emerge in our general culture, that games, in fact, can be kind of a force for good, a force for change, and a very powerful force for education. When I started in the field, games were incredibly primitive, uh, and over my career, it's actually kind of remarkable how they've changed uh, is a media format. Uh, you know, in games, the way I approach games is inherently kind of a process of deconstruction. I look at aspects of the world and kind of take it apart, figure out, you know, how it works, and then turn it into a toy. And, you know, this owes a lot to kind of the constructivist education philosophy, you know, people like Foible, Montessori, and later Papert, Alan Kay, et cetera. But really, I like to take parts of the world, turn them into toys where kids can play with them, and fundamentally start understanding the dynamics and complexities of these things. Now, game design, in fact, is the intersection of a lot of different fields. That's another reason why I kind of really enjoy it, is that as a designer, I get to kind of surf and learn in all these different areas, not just the topics for the games I'm working on, but also kind of the design disciplines that we kind of have to you know, learn and master to bring to the field. Now, I want to talk a little bit about education, I mean entertainment, and the way it's changing right now. We kind of fundamentally have this view of entertainment, uh, you know, typically Hollywood is kind of what we think of. But right now in the entire entertainment industry, uh, we have these different silos. And, you know, it's a very different process, you know, when people are making films or games or music. Uh, they're thought of very differently, they're produced very differently. Uh, and that's changing very rapidly right now. Because of the digital revolution, uh, what's happening is basically a major extinction event in the entertainment industry. The digital revolution came along and the technologies are driving totally different behaviors, different forms of entertainment are emerging from this and it's totally impacting the business models, et cetera. So we have this technology curve that more and more is following Moore's law, but lagging behind it are basically kind of our social responses and our business responses to that. And that's where a lot of the disruption is occurring. Much like academics, you know, academics kind of has these different fields, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier today on a panel, that I found that a lot of the really interesting work in academic areas happens kind of at the boundaries between them. And uh, I think that that's been really interesting, the synergies that are happening, you know, in academics, that also are starting to happen in the games industry and the music industry and the movie industry, et cetera. So I think that we're kind of moving away from the idea that you work in the, you know, the game industry or the music industry, into the idea of interdisciplinary entertainment, that all these things are merging together. I think from you know, an individual's point of view, these aren't really necessarily different. I want to do something you know, and have fun, et cetera, and I don't make that distinction, you know, what's on my iPhone. You know, I have music on there, I have movies, I have games, et cetera. As a designer, I've always kind of felt like you know, there's this kind of rough tree of different design fields that goes all the way down. And as a designer, I've always kind of felt like it was incumbent upon me to kind of climb my way up that stream, you know, almost like a salmon swimming upstream. So starting out as a game designer, you know, I then start to broaden my perspective on the world as an interactive designer. And from there, you know, to entertainment design, which is kind of where I feel like I'm at right now. I'm trying to understand how we can integrate all these different kind of fields together into one thing. And it's kind of interesting because you can imagine a world in which we have people that maybe design houses and that's all they do, and other people that design skyscrapers, and other ones that design factories, and these are totally different specialties, and we don't have the concept of an architect. Uh, and that's pretty much the way the entertainment industry thinks about design right now, 
is that you have people that you know design music or games, et cetera, but there's nobody that in fact thinks about the comprehensive entertainment space. So knowing how well the whole pursuit of a unified field theory worked out for the physicists, I was thinking that really we should have something like unified entertainment theory. Uh, what would pull all these things together? You know, how do they relate to each other? Um, I did some searching, and the closest thing I could find was this thing from way back in like the 70s and 80s called mood management theory. You know, the rough idea that we seek out entertainment because we want it, you know, to improve our mood. And uh, they went a little bit down this path. I mean, there are a lot of kind of contradictory evidence to this, but this is about the only thing I found that even kind of approached this at all. The idea that there's this kind of mood space and that instinctively we know what vectors we need in that mood space at any given time. And we seek out entertainment that will actually push us along that vector. Now, of course, this really is a much higher dimensional space than this. But it's kind of interesting in that we seemingly do this unconsciously in terms of figuring out the vector where we want to be and what we seek out. You know, it's almost like you kind of know what you want. You know what it's called. You're not quite sure how it's made. And you have no idea why you want it. Um, so I think, you know, if I had another life to lead and you know, could pursue a lot more things, I would love to write a book you know, about the complexities of how we manage this on the personal level because I think it's a very opaque process but something that we're pursuing all the time. Now, working in the entertainment industry, I can kind of tell you, you know, what the actual overall process is like from a designer's point of view. Uh, you know, basically, we have you know, some big entertainment company. And this doesn't really matter if it's a game company or a movie company or whatever. But somewhere you know, in the upper floors of this giant company, some people sit around and they decide, you know, what does the public want now? And they come up with you know, some fairly abstract concept, push it down to the middle managers. Middle managers you know, sit there, shuffle it around, reformulate it, push it down to the lower level creative teams who come up with a concept. They kick it back to the middle managers, basically reject the concept, push it back to the lower level managers, <laughs> reformulate the concept, send it back up, <laughs> finally gets approved. So then they press it down to the designer, which is me, at which point you know, it's my job to take this thing and somehow implement it. So as a designer, I sit there and then brainstorm what are all the different implementations, directions I can take this idea. <laughs> then the designer hands it off to the engineers who then start formulating all these elaborate blueprints. Uh, then we put together the coding team and all the technical people jump on the project team on this. They build some really clunky prototypes, which we then bring into user testing. We bring in a lot of random people, test weird things on them until they fail, at which point we go back, build different prototypes, bring them back to the users, do some more testing. Eventually, when we're kind of happy with it, we put it on a little disk. It goes to some factory. They build a bunch, put them in a box. It's put in a truck, sent to Walmart. Somebody goes into Walmart, buys it, puts this cheap little thing into some expensive electronic thing. At that point, they consume the content. It comes into their brain, starts formulating brain waves and patterns. But eventually, the end result is that we're creating this cocktail of hormones, endorphins, and neurotransmitters. So this is what we really sell. So <laughs> in that sense, I am a drug dealer. Uh, now, at the end of the day, these people back up at the top floor of that office, you know, get some kind of charts and graphs to find out whether they're successful or not. But there's a huge disconnect, I think, between you know, what we're actually selling and the way in which it's produced. So I think fundamentally we're dealing with a situation where, you know, we have a disconnect between the idea of entertainment and education. You know, as organisms, we're fundamentally, you know, faced with this... Uh, situation where we have a limited bubble of experience that we can ever have as individuals. And those experiences are going to guide our behavior, our strategies, our understanding of the world around us. As we get older, that you know, bubble of experience gets wider and wider, but still it's extremely limited. Um, you know, in our head, we're actually building models of the world using kind of internal mechanisms in our imagination, things like classification, causality, empathy, agency, you know, how can we affect the systems? These are things that we're kind of building, you know, our models out of, models of the world around us, you know. There's another concept of schema, which is that we have experiences and we abstract from those experiences. You know, the kind of, in this case, a causal relationship. When I go to a restaurant, and we've all been to lots of restaurants, there's certain things that you roughly expect in a restaurant. Not every restaurant will have all these, but these are patterns that through experience, we start to abstract these patterns and we can apply them to new situations. So when we go into a new restaurant, we kind of have some rough understanding of what to expect there. Now, we need lots of examples to build these effectively. And so evolution, in fact, has discovered ways for us to supplement our limited experience with wider experiences. One way we do this is by having toy experiences, ones that aren't real. We're basically little model experiences that we can build schema and patterns out of. Another op way we do this is by sharing with the experience of others. Others can download their experience into us, and we can learn from their experiences as though we've had them. Uh, over time, we've come to call one of these play and the other one's story. Uh, and I think really that's why these two things exist, why evolution has discovered these. These are fundamentally educational technologies that we use to build more effective models of the world based upon a wider variety of experience than we have available to us. 
Now, I think story and play have a really interesting relationship with each other. The best stories, the ones that have really captivated my mind, are ones that were inherently deconstructive. I could pull apart the elements of Star Wars, and they have lightsabers, and the Force, and the Death Star, and all that. And then people can go out and kind of play with those experiences. So the best stories are ones that are deconstructive and lead to play experiences where I can take ownership and use them as kind of you know, elements or ingredients for my play. On the other hand, the best play experiences are one that are inherently generative. Uh, usually the stories that I hear from gamers are the most meaningful, the ones that they made up in the game, not the game story that the designer was trying to tell, but the ones that they uniquely kind of recreated in the game experiences. So I think story and play are self-supporting kind of in that sense. They're both forms of model building at the end of the day. Now, it's also kind of interesting because if you think about this, you know, it kind of explains why these artificial experiences uh, might be higher value to somebody who's younger, who has less of a base of experience. And over time, just in general, and I don't mean to say that older people don't play at all, but they seem to value it less than young people. Uh, and so I think that, in fact, it kind of naturally occurs that as you start building up real world experiences, these kind of artificial experiences have less and less kind of value to you. Now, looking at the overall entertainment landscape, you know, if I wanted to be an entertainment designer, I need to kind of understand what is the landscape over which entertainment occurs. I went out on the internet and I started doing some searching just of all the things that I considered entertainment and trying to quantify them monetarily. And it's very hard, and these numbers are just very speculative, so take them with a grain of salt. But uh, really, the two biggest piles I found were generally sports and the internet. The internet was very hard to quantify monetarily, but I think it's you know hundreds of billions of dollars. Sports is over $400 billion, roughly, depending on how you measure it. Uh, the next tier down, we have kind of basically pornography, TV, and gambling, which are all in the $100 billion range in terms of how much people are willing to spend on these activities. Then down from there, we have movies, music, games, and then kind of down lower and lower tiers. Now, it's interesting that the cultural significance we apply to these is not matching the monetary dollars that we're putting out for them. But there, within this ecosystem, I try to kind of sort it very roughly. We kind of have story experiences kind of up in one corner here, play experiences down another. And the third was almost miscellaneous, but I've kind of decided to call these kind of experiential or voyeuristic. These things that are a little bit more direct, perceptual experiences. Now, these are not hard and fast categories. These are just kind of very rough landmarks within a higher dimensional landscape for me to kind of understand it. But they're very much currents within this landscape. When you think about kind of an entertainment form, like a movie comes out, and then after the movie it might go to games or to uh, TV or whatever. And these underlying currents, I think, have a lot to do with why we attach more cultural significance to some of these than others. If you just take one of these and say, okay, when a sporting event happens, where is it likely to flow into other formats, other entertainment experiences? There's kind of primary flows and then like secondary flows that go from there. Uh, if you look at something like movies, you start realizing that movies have tendrils all out through this whole ecosystem. So even though the movie industry isn't worth that much on paper here, the secondary monetization of it is tremendous because it's so interlinked in this web, in this landscape. There's also, I think, a similar kind of landscape here of platforms. These are kind of the formats or the technologies in which we enjoy these, locations, et cetera. I haven't really developed this as much as I'd like to yet, but there are trends happening within this entire landscape. You know, kind of one of the more obvious trends is going from, you know, what we used to consider information gathering to entertainment. Uh, more people, I think, get their, you know, real news information from The Daily Show than from, you know, broadcast networks. Uh, a lot of people actually said that started back with 60 Minutes in 1968, which was, up to that time, television news was considered kind of a non-profit public service. It was not expected to make money. 60 Minutes was the first profitable news show on television, and at that point, all the networks said, our news shows have to be profitable, you know, which basically kind of led to predictable results. Uh, so even things that we think of as, uh, you know, real news are driven by profit motives and in some sense are entertainment driven. Uh, I think there's another trend in entertainment, which is kind of the fractalization of entertainment. Uh, the more successful franchises, you know, you can think of fractals as like these self-similar patterns that repeat at different scales. And I think you see that more and more in entertainment franchises. Something like Star Wars, you know, they had kind of like the six major movies. But between those, they started doing like, you know, little books and games and things, filling out the backstory, merchandising, et cetera. So almost every little bit of the Star Wars universe has been filled in with some form of entertainment at some scale. And it's very much a fractal experience, the way they're deploying it and the way they're telling that as well. There's another kind of trend that's going on in entertainment. Uh, we used to be, you know, have this model where basically there were certain uh, producers, professionals that would make movies and we'd go sit in the theater and watch the movie, or music, or games. Uh, there was a big wall between content producers and content consumers. But new technology is basically starting to break down that wall. You know, people are getting more, in, more involved in every single form of entertainment, uh, not just as a consumer, but as a producer at some level. 
Um, there's also a trend, I think, from individual to social interaction. Uh, you can think about entertainment kind of, you know, how individual, you know, am I doing it by myself versus with other people? And also, how much is the entertainment focused on me personally or just about something else? You know, web surfing really isn't so much about you, maybe your interests, but you're kind of doing that and it's a very individual activity. Certain single player games might be focused about you where you're kind of putting yourself in the game, but it's still an individual experience. Uh, multiplayer games, of course, are kind of about you, what you do with a friend next to you. Uh, going to a movie theater can be a very social experience, but it's not about you, it's about the characters on the screen. But there's also on the social side kind of an interesting distinction, I think, between synchronous and asynchronous experiences. Uh, we're starting to see more and more social asynchronous experiences that are starting to invade the entertainment space, where I, in fact, am interacting with other people, um, not in real time. Now, the military has this concept of force multipliers, that they can kind of develop things that, you know, in, uh, one example is night vision. So basically, one soldier on the battlefield with night vision equipment at night is worth three regular soldiers without it, and that's called a force multiplier. Uh, I think that entertainment has its own set of force multipliers that appear pretty broadly, no matter what format you're looking at. You know, number one is novelty. Uh, this is something brand new, unique, nobody's ever seen before. It kind of breaks the box. Um, but just because it's novel doesn't mean it's not stupid. Uh, so novelty alone you know, is not going to sell something, but it can be a force multiplier on a meaningful experience to begin with. I think Apple's surfed this very well. You know, things as simple as the little uh, shuttle wheel on the original iPod felt very novel. It was very fun to people to experience and kind of interact with in a tactile sense. And the multi-touch interface on the uh, iPhone as well. Um, these were solid experiences already. The MP3 player and the phone had a lot of value to begin with. And these were multipliers on that experience from an individual's point of view. Social experiences are a huge force multiplier we're finding in entertainment. Um, now, social experiences can either be something where it's social on one end of the platform. We're sitting in front of a game machine or a television, enjoying you know, that entertainment in a group. Uh, more and more in the entertainment space, we're starting to see social experiences that are moderated through the platform. So that we're each at our computer and we're doing something in World of Warcraft or some other kind of online environment. But it's still a very social experience, even though we're not on the same end of the box. Portable. Portability has been a huge force multiplier, especially of late. Um, you know, we've always had certain formats. In fact, that's where print was always, you know, had an excellent advantage over other things and that it was so highly portable. Uh, but then recently, you know, we started kind of climbing up that ladder of portability. And even things that we don't really think of as entertainment platforms, you know, like our cars, you know, for the longest time we've had the idea of a radio and I sit and listen to music in my car. Um, but those are developing as well. Other formats, you know, games, TV, even our GPS systems at some point, you know, in the near future are going to become entertainment systems. Uh, not just sitting there and telling you jokes, but actually making navigating, making the area around you, the map, the opportunities you have, you know, relative to you right now, uh, entertainment experiences. And of course, in the mobile device space, uh, this is just kind of skyrocketing right now. Multitaskable is something that is almost generational. You know, if you look at kids, you know, under, let's say, 25, the amount of multitasking they do is actually extraordinary. And that's their normal state of existence. It's not like something they do every now and then. Um, now, you know, you can kind of carry that too far, and society is still kind of responding to that. But this is obviously not kind of a short-term blip, but it's long-term trend. I think we always want to feed our brains. Our brains are probably the happiest when they're right at this boundary of being challenged. And so you'll see somebody sitting in something with their laptop while they're listening to music and all that. And I think what they're really doing is kind of achieving this flow state where they're getting just enough, you know, input, bandwidth processing to challenge their brain and put them into this flow state. And they don't want to be bored one second, one minute of one day. And of course, mood enhancing, if we kind of go back and say, what is the effect of this? What endorphins is this releasing in my brain? That's always been a huge force multiplier. And that's relative to the rest of the entertainment landscape around you. Now, I want to talk a little bit now about what I'm calling the hive mind, uh, which is basically the social intelligence that are starting to emerge around this right now collectively, especially in online environments. Now, we've always had the idea of kind of collective human groups working together toward a you know, common goal. We call these institutions. We've had you know, religious institutions, national, you know, academic, community-based as well. Other ones that are kind of weird mixtures of all these. Uh, you know, these have been around forever, but they've always tended to be very hierarchical you know, for various reasons, very top-down, very slow-responding. Uh, and obviously the world is changing very fast. It's becoming much more interconnected, much more web-like. Uh, in some sense we're calling it more flat, but really I think flat is exactly the wrong term. It's multidimensional is what's becoming. You know, these connections are occurring across so many dimensions that we can't even visualize it. And so it, they defy this kind of intuitive understanding that we want to apply to it. 
Uh, and so one of the questions that kind of occurred to me is, why is this format, this organizational topology, occurring now? Why is this more advantageous than it was, you know, 300 years ago with the Roman Catholic Church? Now, one of the recent kind of... Uh, areas that shed a lot of light on this, I think, is network theory, you know, which is the idea that when you look at a network, there are actually some very simplifying assumptions. But one of the things I think that's changed dramatically for us is the idea of transport time. How long does it take information, materials, whatever, to move across a network? Uh, now, you know, a couple hundred years ago, if I wanted to send a message to my friend in France, you know, it was many weeks or months, whatever, by slow boat, you know, for me to send a piece of correspondence, and the chance of it actually getting to him was fairly low to begin with. Um, over time, we shortened that to a matter of days, uh, then eventually, you know, a matter of hours, based on air transport, et cetera. We had faster techniques kind of available in the meantime, but these were not generally, you know, widely available techniques to the average person, you know. For the longest time, up until just recently, really, uh, you know, physically moving a letter from point A to point B was the way most correspondence happened between individuals across the world. Now, there were some really interesting attempts uh, you know, fairly far back, 100 years ago, 80 years ago, to speed this up. Um, one of them was uh, around the turn of the last century, a lot of major U.S. cities, New York, Chicago, Boston, developed these pneumatic transport systems and had these elaborate systems of pneumatic tubes to develop, deliver mail. All of lower Manhattan was actually wired with this to thousands of locations, and the post office, you know, had this giant switching thing where they would send mail all across New York City through pneumatic transport. And, you know, at the time they were kind of thinking, okay, this is the wave of the future. This was their internet. In fact, the internet is a series of pipes, you know, from this point of view. Uh, and they were going to scale this up from correspondence to actually things like transportation. I mean, that was kind of their vision of the future. Uh, but after a few years of maintaining these pipes and seeing them break down and all this, uh, they kind of uh, hit the limits of practicality there. In fact, right now, if you go to Lower Manhattan and look at some of the old buildings, you'll see these, still, these pipes on the outsides of buildings where they used to deliver the mail. Uh, there was another really interesting trend I came across from around the 1920s, which was the trend what they called rocket mail. Uh, I found this particularly intriguing. The idea is that you take a rocket, you load it up with mail, and then you shoot it toward Boston somewhere. Um, <laughs> there was a guy that went around Germany giving all these demonstrations, you know, and about one out of four rockets would blow up on the pad, incinerating all the mail. Um, and I, I never quite understood the landing part of this. You know, I'm imagining New York City with this giant field outside and a giant bunch of craters and people running out there looking for letters to themselves, but <laughs> I, I never quite got that. And in fact, the Navy got in on this. They, in fact, did some test demonstrations where from submarines they were launching rockets and they delivered their first official missile mail. But uh, anyway, it anyway, just kind of reinforced why, you know, I love the Internet because you trip across things like this all the time. That, uh, the serendipitous of the internet is extraordinary to me. In fact, computers kind of took a while to get going. You know, the early computers um, were a much more pain than they were worth, and it's only recently they started gaining any real traction in the world around us. But once they started gaining traction, you know, on this network thing in terms of speed across the network, you know, we started having email, which, you know, for the first time I could send, you know, asynchronous communication to somebody across the world at very low cost, very high speed. But that was just the beginning, you know, then we went to uh, text messaging and then things like Twitter. So it's still accelerating the ability for us to send communications rapidly through this hive mind, this group of individuals. Um, and it's not just the speed, it's also the format to which we connect, you know. So we have the ability for peer-to-peer -peer communication. I can send a unique message to a specific person. I can also broadcast a message within a whole group, you know, basically self-publish. Or I can do any combination of the two. I can do microcasting and say, I only want these ten people, this subgroup of this group, to get that. And so, in fact, kind of that format, that dimension of flexibility I have in communication, I think is essential. Because if you actually look at the neurons in your brain, in fact, they are wired up very differently. Some neurons are targeting a very small number. Other one's a very large number. And so the collective intelligence I think we see in our brain is dependent on this kind of variable topology as well. And also our technology is allowing us, you know, despite, you know, the topology, we can send something synchronous or asynchronous. I can send a message to a group or to an individual synchronously or asynchronously, which I think is fundamentally important. Now, so basically our teenagers are turning into this hive mind. You know, the next generation is turning into this collective intelligence because of the infrastructure that's being wired around them. Uh, this girl actually one, she's like 13 years old, two years ago she won the World Texting Championship. She spelled supercalifragilisticexpialidocious in 15 seconds on her little phone there. Um, and it's extraordinary to me how that generation has just grown up kind of assuming this. This is just part of the way they think about communicating in the world. Now, when I talk about hive intelligences, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense at all. I've always been fundamentally fascinated by social insects and hive intelligences and how incredibly smart they can be relative to the individual members. You know, an ant colony, in a lot of cases, can exhibit the problem solving of a smart dog, 
It's that, you know, they really are that smart. And the individual ants are so incredibly stupid that we pretty much can reverse engineer them. You know, and they're about as smart as a laptop, really. In fact, dumber than that in terms of the raw processing capability. So if you take human intelligence and assume it's that low and look at how much ants can scale up into a hive intelligence, I think that the community intelligences that are emerging out of this give you some sense of how much more, uh, how much, how different the behavior is going to be out of these hive intelligences to the point where we might not even recognize it as intelligence from the point of view of the ant. Now, of course, you know, we have these technology networks that are enabling all this, but there are a lot of other networks over which this is playing out simultaneously. We have the social networks, the connections that these things are allowing us to now form collectively between people. We have the brain networks, which of course at the lowest level, as I was showing with the endorphins, are actually kind of playing out on. We have the format networks, where I was showing kind of the entertainment formats, and the platform networks. So there are a lot of different networks really that are converging, and so this is an extremely complicated, basically, landscape. That's uh, dynamics are occurring at many different scales. It's causing this revolution, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so resistant to our understanding at this point in time. Now, another thing from network theory is that you can look at the number of links in kind of uh, a random network like this, and you'll find that you know a very small number of links have a lot of connections. So one node in this network has five connections to it. Uh, two, network, two nodes in this network have four connections, and it decreases like that. Um, this is a very fundamental thing about networks, which is known as power law distribution. And uh, this is true whether you're looking at, you know, websites connected on the internet, um, whether you're looking at metabolic networks within a body, whether you're looking at economic networks and the flow of money through a system, they all exhibit this uh, kind of power law distribution, uh, which has a lot of interesting repercussions as well. Um, there's also the concept of graph, graph width, which you can pick any two points in one of these networks and measure how many links does it take to get from point A to point B. In this simple little network, it's you know five jumps to get from point A to point B. Um, it doesn't matter how large you scale that network up, it very rarely goes above six, uh, which basically ensures the continual immortality of Kevin Bacon. But it's kind of extraordinary that the difference between a small graph like this and the internet is very little as far as the number of jumps you have to take to get across it. Now, uh, one way to kind of visualize this for me is that you could imagine a number line, out of a, you know, one out of a hundred, and I pick a random number. And, you know, what's the chance that you could pick that same random number? You know, one in a hundred is the chance, one percent chance that you might pick that. Now, if we move this to a two-dimensional space, the space is now 10,000, you know, coordinates. Uh, the chance of you picking my unique coordinate is one in 10,000. But the chance of us actually connecting on one dimension has actually gone up. It's now you have a two percent chance of actually matching one of my coordinates. If we scale this up to three dimensions, it keeps going. And then we get into these high multi-dimensional spaces. This is where it gets kind of counterintuitive. Although, when we get to six dimensions, it's now a trillion spots. The chance of you picking my spot in that six dimensional space is one in six trillion. The chance of us ma uh, actually matching on one dimension is actually quite a bit higher than it was on that simple number line. So the fact these spaces are getting multi-dimensional uh, and making them absolutely huge is in, in fact increasing the chance that we might connect on one of the dimensions within that space. Now, one thing about hives, you know, we tend to think of things like bees and ants and all that. Um, when we scale this up to humans and communities and online stuff, it's kind of important to realize that I don't mean that all the members are, uh, in, are basically drones or identical. Uh, in fact, what happens is we see kind of really interesting specializations among the members when we start forming these human hives. Uh, the same thing happens in nature, you know. Basically what happens in nature is that whenever communication is enabled between a group, uh, now they have the opportunity to uh, cooperate as a group. Now, the more they can communicate, the more they cooperate, the tighter they cooperate, the more they want to specialize. Uh, this happens time and time again at different levels of biology, economics, etc. Uh, it was only when um, nerve cells really were developed in biology that multicellular organisms had the ability to evolve because now the individual cells could specialize and they had a communications infrastructure to where they could coordinate their activities. Uh, same thing happens in economic you know, networks. You know, once you have a certain level of coordination and communication, then whole industries start to specialize. And you have your auto company over here that's buying parts from these smaller sub companies and so forth and so on. Uh, to the point where we're even specializing like our land utilization because of the communications transportation networks that we build. Um, there's also kind of an aspect of identity that happens in these spaces. You know, everybody kind of is a member of different communities in some sense that might be part of their job, where they live, what they do, brands they enjoy, etc. In some sense, each one of us is a member of many, many communities all at once. Uh, as well as these communities can be very nested. You know, I'm a citizen of the United States. Uh, maybe I also am a Californian or, a, you know, a 
person who lives in Los Angeles or Westwood. So we, in fact, even within a community geographic setting, we are living in numerous nested communities as well. One of my favorite uh, things to do a long time ago before the internet was to go to newsstands and look at all the weird magazines because for me, this is the closest thing I had to a map of the communities of people out there. You know, some of these were interest-based communities, other ones were professional-based communities, but the newsstand for me was kind of the map of communities that had reached a certain level of threshold. Enough people were out there that considered themselves into guns or into mountain bikes where they would actually support a magazine. And so for me, this was kind of a map uh, of this developing. Now when the internet came out, you know, the very first thing that happened on Usenet before the World Wide Web were these Usenet news groups. And we saw these really interesting maps of the communities that were coming onto the early internet, forming, you know, these communities at different scales and it's very nested. And there was no land shortage here, which drove a very different dynamic around these communities than it did in the real world in some sense. Uh, you know, a lot of economic theory kind of around communities and stuff, I sp studied a lot of city planning working on SimCity. One of the basic kind of uh, laws of economic theories applied to like urban dynamics was the fact that people were competing for land. Uh, and whoever got the land was the person willing to bid the most for that piece of land. And it came down to who could extract the most value. Uh, so as an example, you know, commercial uh, businesses, retail, et cetera, generally would pay more to be close to the city center. And as you went away from the city center, they valued the land less and less and less very rapidly. Uh, so they had a very steep, what they called rent bid gradient. Residential, they wanted to be fairly close to what the, where they worked, but they didn't mind being a little bit further out, so they weren't willing to pay as much for the downtown area. Uh, in industrial, the least. You know, they really just wanted a lot of cheap land, which really kind of uh, structured the modern American city as to kind of why you have different zones in different areas, and eventually led to zoning that, in fact, kind of instantiated this. But this is very much based upon the idea that the marketplace out there is one where people are bidding for land, and the people who bid the most get that land and get to live there. Now, there was a change around the 70s in urban planning toward what they called the human ecology perspective, which is a totally different way of looking at it. What if instead of the people competing for the land, it was the land competing for the people? Uh, if you imagine something like a homeowners association, and they want to bring in a certain type of person because it's going to enhance land values, and they're going to keep their lawn up, et cetera, et cetera. So in some sense, you know, once people plop down on the landscape, it now became the community competing for the most uh, advantageous individuals that would make their community even more valuable. Uh, and so then we had the rise of gated communities, et cetera, et cetera. But in the internet, I think it's very much more the case. This is a much better paradigm for net-based communities than it was for geographic-based communities. We're always being bombarded by these communities saying, join us, come here. And your friends are even saying, oh, I'm on you know, LinkedIn or Facebook. Why don't you join? And so the members of this community are actively basically recruiting you all the time into these communities. It's kind of like rush week at college all the time when you go online. Now, as I said, simultaneously, you're a member of all these communities, and you can think of each of these communities in some sense as a hive brain, where every individual human potentially is one neuron in many hive brains all at once. And at that point, they're competing for your time. You know, where are you spending more time, more effort, more creativity? Where are you getting more socially engaged and actually recruiting other people into that hive brain? So basically, it's a very Darwinian you know, competition between these brains, even though the individual members might span them as they're competing. You know, in some sense, these things can just spring up overnight instantaneously. The friction, because it's online, is radically different. There's no cost to, you know, 10,000 people coming in over the course of a few weeks. And so you have, like, these enormous squatter cities that will pop up overnight, except in this case, the squatters all have jetpacks. And it doesn't take much at all for them to just fly out and go to another squatter city. Now, so if we have these hive minds out on the internet kind of processing at a different level, than the individual, how do we entertain them? You know, what are you know, things that they would enjoy and how are they different than entertaining individuals? Now, one thing we found is that they have a voracious appetite. Uh, these hive brains can process information so much more rapidly. Their kind of information metabolism is so far beyond the individual, you need to approach it very differently. On the other hand, if you give them the ability to make stuff or to do something, the power of their collective effort is enormous. Um, and I'm always, always underestimating this myself, even though I have a very high regard for it. Uh, when we turn these communities on as entertainment designers, we're trying to kind of craft some experience that we think a community will coalesce around. You know, more and more I think of myself as not making a cool game, but how do we build a cool community? What kind of game would spark a really cool community that will now build up around that game? So in that sense, the game really is just the kind of little sand particle that the pearl forms around inside the oyster. Now, the first game I did was way back in 1984, and I was the only person working on it. Uh, I did the whole thing, box, art, sound, everything. Next game I did was 89, uh, and I had you know two or three other people working with me on it. Next game was 94, it was about 10 people. 2000, uh, it was about 20 something. 2004, 
Uh, this has been the trend in my industry in terms of headcount. If I actually look at the people and how they were deployed, the people developing content, you know, within these games, you know, like the art assets, the characters, the backgrounds, landscapes, and ever, they were actually scaling up even faster than the whole team size. Um, at some point, I decided to extrapolate this outward into the future, and I found that by the year 2050, I would take about two and a half million people to create a game, and it would cost about 500 billion dollars. Uh, so we identified this as a problem. Um, <laughs> And started kind of rethinking the way we approach this, you know, because these community intelligences were basically voraciously consuming the content far faster than we could ever produce it. We had to kind of think of a different way to, to approach the problem. Now, if you look at anything, the level of involvement within these communities, you know, can get very high depending on what you do. The number of people involved tends to, you know, flatten out, and again, in a power law distribution. You know, so even in terms of like just kind of identity, somebody might own a product and be in this low end consumer level. Uh, if they're really into cars or trucks or whatever, they might, you know, subscribe to a magazine. Very few will actually kind of go out and really go into, you know, deep community. This is the way it kind of used to be, this very, very steep curve, because they actually had to physically go out, find people in a nearby area. The communities weren't that interesting. It's very high friction for them to get involved in these things. Uh, even in media, you know, we, again, had this idea that you were a consumer or a producer. Very few people kind of were willing to climb that very steep hill to get to the top. But then technology came along, and it started giving people the ability to make things, not not at a professional level, but kind of an interesting level to where the people want to look at it. And we're starting to pull this curve up. So in fact, it's more of a smooth ramp from consumer to producer and not such a steep cliff. You know, and really, that's one of our big, uh, in games and I think in entertainment in general, this is one of our big focuses right now is how do we smoothen that ramp between the consumer and the producer? Now, one thing you also want to do that we found, you know, we have a few people up here at the high level of these communities. How do we take those people that have climbed up there and make them a point of value to the people below? Uh, so it's not just that we want people to climb this hill, but we want them to actually be producing stuff that the people below find interesting. So in some sense, they are now entertaining the masses below and not just us. Uh, one of the game I just worked on is called Spore, and one of the concepts in Spore is that we wanted to give the players the ability to make cool stuff in the game very easily. In fact, make that part of the gameplay. It's not something you decide to go off, oh, I think I'll make something for other people, but while playing the game, you can't help but make stuff for other people because that's part of the gameplay. Uh, we had done stuff with other games before. We gave players tools to make things in our games, and you know, we got this kind of thing where we had some stuff that really was not great. You know, Most of it was not great. Uh, some of it was okay. Uh, a small amount of it was actually pretty good, and a very small amount of it really was great. Um, what we really were trying to figure out was how do we pull up this into the curve so the area under this, the you know, the value area, what I call, um, was much higher for the other players. So those players who were enjoying making really cool stuff were larger in population and were more basically bait for the rest of the community. Um, I'm going to pop in real quick if this works here and um, just give you a very brief demo. I'm just going to show you one little tiny bit of Spore to give you some sense of it. But um, within Spore, you have the ability to go in, and almost anything in the game you can create. Uh, so one of the things you can create, you know, whole planets, buildings, cities, creatures, etc. This is the creature editor, for instance. And we wanted in just a couple you know, minutes for a player to grab parts, you know, as they pull the parts out here, uh, the creature starts to come to life, and you can kind of, you know, there's very much a WYSIWYG kind of interface here. Uh, I can extend the spine, add parts, the parts all have more targets. As I'm building the creature, the stats on the side are actually showing my creature's speed, its behavior, what it would eat, whether it's a carnivore or not. And it comes to life basically as you build it. You know, what we really wanted to do was give the players the ability of like a Pixar character artist um, in just a few clicks. And this is something for most players is, you know, kind of a very surprising, delightful thing. And we had to teach the computer basically how to do modeling, texturing. You know, once I get a creature I like, I can go in and kind of, the computer will analyze where things like the legs, the backbone, shading, and it will basically apply a texture to this creature. And I can go in and see how it would move. And so the computer is actually structurally analyzing this creature. No two creatures will move or behave the same in here. So the computer is, in fact, taking a lot of the heavy lead work that you know typically our artists would do in this. And we can do things like see what the babies do. We can generate other data from this, so I can kind of see what would the babies of this creature look like. Uh, I don't want to blow through this a little bit faster. But every bit of content in Spore has some editor like this. And it's part of the game. You're actually creating this stuff all the time. And as you create it, we automatically suck it up to our server. And it gets redistributed to other players. So. Here. Within Spore, we're also kind of building a simple little social network. And I can sit here and actually browse all the content 
there's other players are made. I can find out who made it, I can subscribe to them, put them on a buddy list, etc. So there's a huge component of this that is both creative and also kind of social networking. Now, I'm gonna skip through this a little bit, but basically Explorer is taking these simple inputs from the player. It's now, you know, under the hood generating mesh, texture, animations, behavior, and fully, you know, building this asset. It's about five megabytes, but the description that meg of that uh, creature is about 20K. And that compression, that you know, high compression is actually very useful in a lot of ways. You know, it gives us a lot of creative leverage. In other words, they're entering very little data to get a very elaborate result. Uh, we can store huge databases of this very cheaply. And it has very low friction to transport. We can send lots of this over the web very, very cheaply. And we can use it to drive generative systems. So even if the player's not creating this stuff, we can teach the computer to create it much more easily now. Now, kind of getting back to entertainment, um, if we look, you know, the way like television used to work, it used to work, you know, a show would go on television, you know, thousands, millions, whatever, eyes would sit there, watch it, process it and sit in their brains, enjoy it, and maybe the next day you talk about it over the water cooler. You know, that was about the level of kind of community that built up around these things. The kind of the new model, I think, is shown very much by a show like Lost. Um, same thing, you know, it goes on TV, you know, a million people watch it, it goes in their eyes, but now it goes into this collective brain. Uh, immediately, they're online. Even before the episode's over, they're online talking about it and kind of developing theories, and they have the power to do stuff, which is the really interesting part. They can actually create stuff. Um, there's this thing, which is basically like Wikipedia, but it's Lostpedia, and it's kind of like the center of the Lost community. And they basically get together and share all this knowledge and develop theories. And you know, just this one little community around this one little TV show, it makes a good example here. They reverse engineered the entire map of the world here after about the fifth episode, based on triangulating of the characters, the background, where the mountain was, what they were talking about, and built a very accurate map of this whole environment. Uh, this appeared on the screen in one episode for about three seconds. Uh, and the fans transcribed it, went, uh, most of it's in Latin, by the way. Uh, they went through, figured out what all the writing said, translated it from Latin, started developing theories around that. Every now and then, these little hieroglyph hieroglyphics appear in Lost. They've actually built a huge database, cross-correlated these, and reverse engineered the language of these hieroglyphics, which was built for the television show. This is a kind of a minor character, Jin, in Lost, by no means one of the major characters. Um, and I started looking at his entry, you know, basically all the stuff the fans have collected about this guy. Uh, and I started scrolling through this and scrolling through it. And then I went back and looked, and it turned out this guy's Lostpedia entry is longer than Barack Obama's Wikipedia entry. <laughs> um, this is for a mid-level fictional character in a television show. Uh, and I'm convinced, actually, now more than anything else, that you know, I don't know if any of you watch Lost, but I'm pretty convinced that the whole Dharma Initiative was based upon the Aspen Institute at this point. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but behind the scenes, the creators of Lost, you know, obviously have this huge correlated thing that they're building. It's a puzzle game, really. And in fact, certain players are uncovering cool things that do connect. And there's a huge kind of positive feedback to the players in that. In some sense, they're building these layers of content that you know, most players are kind of casual beachcombers. They come along and they might get little you know, bits and pieces of this, but certain ones are very dedicated and they're digging way down deep into these layers and finding these amazing things. Um, and what makes it work is that these dedicated archeologists are actually then put this stuff on display for the average person. So even though the average person isn't doing the, you know, the legwork, they still appreciate the output of these other people and it becomes a more entertaining, fulfilling experience for them. So those people we focus on a lot, you know, even though they're a very small population of these communities, they're very important. Uh, there's a Japanese concept of otaku, which is like an uh, overly enthusiastic fan about something. In fact, you go to a place like Comic-Con, and that's where you see these guys. Um, wh why they're important is that in a, fail in a network like this, you can have random failures, which might be people leaving the community. If it's a random failure, you know, and this is why the internet was designed the way it was designed, uh, the network is quite resilient. You know, it doesn't really destroy the network much. On the other hand, if you are targeting the hubs of this network and going for the areas that have the highest connectivity, it decimates the network. Uh, these otaku, these highly you know, motivated individuals that have become the pillars of these communities are these dense links. And so we focus on not losing them because the network will fall apart if they disappear. Um, well, like Comic-Con I was mentioning, it's a really interesting ecosystem of these strange communities and the people that kind of run them. It's the only place I know where you can actually go see a Klingon wedding, a movie premiere, and you know, a workshop on how to restore old comic books. But it's a very eclectic group of individuals and communities. Sims community, we studied a lot. And you know, we saw many levels of people kind of working at different you know, areas. Uh, and the people at the very top level were actually you know, giving stuff that the next level wanted. You know, the top levels were basically pulling stuff up through this pyramid. And it was the broad social recognition from the base that was giving these people at the top you know, kind of the motivation to do what they did. 
And Spore, the creature creator that I just showed you, we decided that we would release that early because we wanted to kind of start collecting content ahead of the game. Uh, based upon other things I had done before, my hope was that when we released the game about two months later, that we would have like 100,000 creatures that players you know, would create. And that was kind of what, I thought that was a fairly optimistic assumption that within two months we would have 100,000 unique creatures for our world. Uh, instead, they hit that number in 22 hours after we released it. Uh, they surpassed a million in the first week. Um, just recently, we had uh, a celebration for the 100 millionth creature that was uploaded on our website. You know, in comparison, on Earth, there are 1.5 million identified species, uh, thought to be maybe 5 million you know, unidentified species. So we've vastly exceeded the population of species on Earth with these fictional creatures and spore. Uh, over the first couple months, we had about 45 million assets. That means that we were getting about 715,000 a day from our fans, or about 30,000 an hour. Um, and I think that just is the tip of the iceberg. You know, I think that this really is going to be the direction we take you know, toward the future. How do we harvest these minds for their creative powers that are so far beyond any human ability that we can barely comprehend them at this point? So I'm going to stop talking right now. I think we have about seven or eight minutes for Q&A. Thank you. You can bring lights up if you want. So um, you had said that one of the reasons adults don't play this is that maybe we have enough or a lot of our own experiences and we're not as into play as we used to be when we were little, obviously. And many adults spend more time reading. What do you think is going to happen to the gamers who have been brought up with this? Are they going to progress? Um, through this, and if so, what do you think they'll move towards? Well, I think that there are a couple dynamics occurring here. Um, if we look at the demographics of our players from our games, about every year or so, the average age of our players goes up by about six months. Okay, so over time, people are starting to play games later and later into life. Uh, a lot of it was a chicken and egg problem, where the games really were geared to, you know, 13-year-old boys, and it was all about blowing stuff up. Uh, and now, as older people are playing games later in life, we're starting to see games that are appealing to them more and more because that market is actually developing. I think the Nintendo Wii has actually done a huge uh, job there in appealing to non-gamers. You know, there are uh, retirement homes that now have bowling leagues based upon Wii bowling. Uh, and this is an activity they understand. When you play the Nintendo Wii, you're pretty much doing it the same way you used to bowl. But these are people that don't have the strength to actually pick up a bowling ball now. But they still like the social experience of sitting around and playing bowling with their friends. So I think that uh, we are going to start seeing more and more game experiences appealing to an older and older audience. Uh, I think it's very much kind of a cultural generational shift that we're seeing going on. And I think something very similar is happening kind of in the application of games to educational technologies. You know, we're at the point now where maybe half the teachers out there teaching never really grew up playing games, but about half of them did. And I think it's the teachers that grew up playing games that are going to find the interesting, innovative ways to integrate them into the classroom. Um, since it seems that more males play <coughs> games than females, what do you think the effect of this is going to be on this kind of new generation? And what do you see or do to attract females to play games? And does it matter? Well, that's one of the areas that used to be a huge discrepancy that's actually changing pretty rapidly. We're actually seeing a lot of women play games. They play very different games than uh, men do. Uh, online social games, light games, where you're not having to spend three or four hours, not World of Warcraft, but things like where people are playing cards online or these kind of light games, but it's a social experience. They're playing with you know, five or ten of their friends all at once. But it's also something where they can you know, stop, you know, play for ten minutes and stop. They're very interstitial. So we're finding that interstitial games, games that don't require you to sit down for two minutes or two hours of uninterrupted time are more appealing to women. Also games that have a fo uh, social focus rather than a competitive focus appeal more to women. But uh, at the end of the day, I think we need to get more women in game development. Uh, in my company, we were lucky because of our early games were appealing more to females. We had more of the qualified women in the game industry applying to come work for us, and we tended to hire them. So we ended up with a much higher percentage of women working in our company than is typical in a game company. Uh, on the Sims team, I ended up with about 40% of my game design team on the Sims were female. And The Sims was the first game that actually, you know, in terms of mainstream, go out, buy it off the shelf game, that actually was, uh, had a higher female audience than male audience. It's now running at about 57% female uh, out of all of our customers. But I think I credit that mainly to about half the development team being women. 
And I don't th I'm as a designer, I don't really want to make games for women. I want to make games that are for both genders. For me, the you know the best entertainment experiences are the ones that are equally enjoyed by both genders. Well, a question here. Yeah. Um, you and I have both been involved with the X Prize, which is a way of kind of tapping into a hive mind to focus on innovations and breakthroughs and hard yeah. challenges and things like that. Um, could you talk a bit about hive mind in social gaming and gaming in general, and hive mind in these major challenges that we need to address as a planet, so on and so forth? And is there a way maybe to create a bridge between these two to kind of have gaming bring gaming more involved in addressing some of these major challenges that we have? So. Leverage yeah. kind of the power and excitement and energy you create, say, in, in Spore, um, with some of the kind of technology breakthrough and challenges that we need on the on the kind of XPRIZE side of things. Yeah, I mean, one thing I found, you kind of step back a bit and look at the, the entire landscape of systems, and the, the systems that work really well, the communities that you know, are really thriving, are the ones where there's this exquisite balance between cooperation and competition. Uh, and you know the right balance there makes these things very high performing. So you're competitive on some level, but cooperative on another. And in fact, you know I think that most social organization kind of evolved as a response to that. You know there were individuals, you know whether they're cavemen or whatever, out there just all kind of you know working on their own. At some point, two or three of them banded together, became a tribe, and said, "Hey, we can work together and out compete these individuals." Now the individuals out there were left high and dry. They had to start forming their own little bands to now be cooperative with this tribe. At that point, a few tribes started banding together to make higher level structures, and they became more competitive. And so I think you know, time and time again, it's been competition between you know, individual agents that has driven cooperation amongst those agents, so the competition occurs at the next level. And I think something like the XPRIZE, or even gaming environments, are very much based upon the, you know, the balance of those two dynamics. Uh, and so I'm not sure I can kind of answer any more specifically, but I think we are learning a lot of things at a fairly low cost in virtual environments that we can actually kind of bring back out into things that are more material-based, like the XPRIZE, where in fact you want people sitting there working on real solutions, possibly meeting face-to-face, -face, building prototypes, whatever it is. But I think we can actually learn a lot from these kind of test tube environments. So I think that's our time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs>